Hello everybody, this is Dr. Beter. Today is March 19, 1976, and this is my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 10. In his farewell speech, as our nation's outgoing first President, George Washington warned us with the words, Let there be no change by usurpation, for though this in one instance may be the instrument of good, it is the customary weapon by which free governments are destroyed. He would no doubt be shocked to know that today, nearly two centuries later, his words are more truthful, more urgent, and more up-to-date than all the oceans of meaningless words being poured into the ears of the American public by current Presidential hopefuls. Change by usurpation has become the order of the day as the rights of the people are usurped by our unseen rulers in order to change our way of life, and if the Rockefeller Brothers succeed in their accelerating plan to destroy our Republic right before our very eyes, their new world disorder in alliance with the Soviet Union will engulf us soon with blinding speed. But, my friends, we must not give up, because in the decisive days we are now entering, the Rockefeller Brothers will in many ways be more vulnerable than ever before, because their complex program of conquest is now behind schedule, some parts of it as much as one year behind and they now have to play a deadly game of catch-up ball. They are being forced now to speed up and compress the timing of very major events in the very next few months in an attempt to get back onto schedule, and the hour is now very late for them as well as for you and me. They are behind because they have stumbled repeatedly in the past two years. First they stubbed their toe by leaving a trail in the Fort Knox gold theft which has profoundly disrupted and now ruined some of the planned final stages of David Rockefeller's World Gold Corner. Then for that and other reasons Nelson Rockefeller failed to seize the Presidency according to plan between March and June 1975, and beyond that he has stubbed his toes two more times in the early fall and around Christmas 1975. John D. Rockefeller III, for his part, is being forced to close up shop at the New York office which published the huge Bicentennial Decoration ads one year ago calling for a second American Revolution, the reason being our success in exposing its connection with the secret new Rockefeller Constitution. The work is continuing, but it is concentrated now in the American Revolution Bicentennial Administration, a Federal agency here in Washington headed by John Warner who is on John D. Rockefeller III's Committee of the Second American Revolution, the name given to a book written by John D. Rockefeller, published in early 1973. As for Brother Lawrence, he is occupying himself with the food stamp program and other preparations for war. The stock market, while it is extremely sick now generally, is being kept healthy looking to the general public by means of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is made up almost totally of Rockefeller companies. Until the other elements of their game plan can be put back on the track, the dramatic crash of the Dow is being held in abeyance. The biggest of these other elements, of course, is the coming war, and it too is over a year late now, having been delayed first by Egyptian President Sadat and then thrown into a cocked hat last summer by Indira Gandhi's crackdown on the CIA. Because of these things, among others, the Rockefeller Brothers are faced with a complex juggling act that must orchestrate our economic collapse here in America, worldwide monetary chaos, foreign intrigues, political maneuvering here at home, 
and the igniting of the first stage of World War III in the Middle East. They planned all along to do all of these things, but not on such a tight schedule as they now face. Now they almost have to do these things all at once, or at least in very rapid sequence. If they succeed, the effect will be devastating, but if they trip again now, as they can be made to do by awakening public awareness and reaction, they will be in serious trouble. What's more, they can't turn back. They have opened Pandora's box and unleashed forces that are slipping out of their control. Should they be further delayed long enough, their whole house of cards will begin to fall apart as they are overtaken by the Fort Knox plutonium poison scandal the rapidly spreading exposure of their dictatorial new Constitution, among other things. More than ever now, the one thing that can and will stop them short of their dictatorship goal is the power of the truth spread far and wide. So it is crucial now that we keep our eyes on the international scene as well as that here at home because the two are inseparably linked together in the Rockefeller plan to enslave us all. If they pull it off, it can happen at a time you least expect it, so don't be caught off base. If the worst does happen, you have been warned, and if you have been doing whatever you can to do to warn others, whether it seems a lot or only a little to you, you will know you did your part. To point out the connection between developments here in America and those around the world, I want to discuss the following three topics today. Topic No. 1. World Government and the Destruction of Family Life. Topic No. 2. World Monetary Chaos and the Coming Crash Here in America. And Topic No. 3. World War III and the planned declaration of national emergency. Topic No. 1. To the uninformed, the words World Government or One World Order often bring to mind the utopian picture of a world at peace, relaxed, free, with an abundant life for all. This after all is exactly the image that Rockefeller propaganda is designed to plant in our minds. Then there are others who may vaguely realize that any world order or government on the horizon today would be rather authoritarian in nature, but who would do not feel personally threatened by such a thing. People in this category reason that since, after all, uh, they have no political ambitions anyway, all they would need to do would be to keep their nose clean, do the work they are assigned to do without kicking up a fuss, and things could not be too bad. They are the ones who sometimes say, better red than dead. But those who harbor such comforting notions are wrong, dead wrong. They are not acquainted with the psychology of those who seek world government or one world order a psychology that drives for control, 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 control on the grandest scale possible the entire world, and control all the way down to the smallest scale, your home. In my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 8 for January 1976, I reveal that since at least 1954 there has been an official but super-secret White House policy quote, to so alter life in the United States so that it can be comfortably merged with life in the Soviet Union." Unquote. This is why we see an unending stream of apparent mistakes, concessions, and blunders by the modern outlaw band that masquerades as our government. These are not errors at all, but deliberate steps in the Rockefeller march toward dictatorial world domination with their Soviet allies. And this includes the Sovietization of family life, 
the last great bulwark against total world domination. It is not hard to see, of course, that American family life is under great pressure because the evidence is everywhere. It's common knowledge. The divorce rate is rising, the birth rate is falling, and the Census Bureau claims that the average family size is now at a record low level and still dropping. Individuals are becoming more and more isolated. But few people know that we are seeing the fruits of a deliberate war on the American family, and fewer still know that this is an integral part of the Rockefeller drive for dictatorship. This attack on family life is well organized, heavily funded, and multifaceted. But the most important, most diabolical part of it all is an intense but sugar-coated campaign now underway to gain control of your children. The objective? To break down your control over your children and place them instead under the supervision and control of the community, that is, the government. In other words, they are to be Sovietized. One aspect of this attack on your children is the subtle use of familiar already available avenues of communication and education. Take for example that famous children's program, Sesame Street. Have you watched it lately? Financed primarily by Rockefeller-controlled foundations and the Federal Government, Sesame Street has followed the standard Rockefeller philanthropic formula that emerged over 70 years ago. It established its halo in the public eye by early programming, but has progressively turned its efforts in more sinister directions under the protection of that halo. Arguments, bad temper, hurt feelings, and even cartoons with an air of unreality are prominent today on Sesame Street, and you will look in vain for any trace of an identifiable family image. Meanwhile, the impressionable young Sesame Street audience is treated to such things as a recent episode showing all about how easy, painless, and perhaps even fun it is to use a tourniquet and syringe all of it more explicitly than you will see on nighttime adult programming. Harried young mothers, trusting in the spotless reputation of Sesame Street, often allow their children to watch with little or no supervision, not realizing that concepts like this which pave the way for early and easy drug addiction are being burned into their, into their children's minds. Sesame Street is a product of the Children's Television Workshop, whose President is Joan Gans Cooney. She is a Rockefeller Insider who a year ago signed the Bicentennial Declaration which I mentioned earlier, launching the Rockefeller Second American Revolution to bring in their secret new Constitution. Another example is seen in the big textbook controversy which has made headlines because of the efforts of parents to prevent their introduction into public schools. Their objections, based on the degrading and immoral material they see in the books, have not succeeded in stopping these books, although the books have been slowed down. The purpose of these books is to utilize the system of compulsory education for a captive audience supported by your taxes but largely removed from your control nowadays, to shove down your children's throats whatever the Rockefellers decide they should learn. The goal of these books is to make your child think in terms of questioning your motives and challenging your authority against a background of crumbling values. The idea is to subtly rob your child of everything he subconsciously clings to for strength and security until suddenly he will find himself totally lost at sea and alone and utterly dependent upon the all-knowing, 
all-powerful Federal Government. But programs such as these, which use existing channels to brainwash your child, are only half of the story. The other half is a gigantic effort to construct an entire new apparatus nationwide to which to take a giant leap toward formalized and ultimately complete control of your child. This is the drive for what is euphemistically called comprehensive child care. This goes far, far beyond the mere establishment of some handy daycare centers to help out working mothers as you may have been led to believe. Currently before Congress are two essentially identical bills, Senate Bill 626 in the Senate, House Resolution 2966 in the House of Representatives, called the Child and Family Services Act of 1975 in the Senate version. It resurrects a measure which would have become law late in 1971 except that America's last elected President, Richard Nixon, vetoed it. He did so with a warning that it would commit the vast power of the Federal Government, quote, to the side of communal approaches to child rearing over against the family-centered approach, unquote, adding that it would be, quote, truly a long leap into the dark for the United States Government and the American people, unquote. My friends, he was absolutely right. I believe in giving credit where credit is due, and Richard Nixon deserves nothing but credit for that veto, which truly served the interests of the American people in defiance of his Rockefeller bosses behind the scenes. Now the One World Order Rockefeller forces are trying once again to push the same thing through with the aid of a new name and a little face lifting. The connection between this so-called child care bill and the campaign for world government is obvious in many ways, right down to the personalities involved. For example, last month I mentioned that the Rockefeller-sponsored Declaration of Interdependence was introduced last October in, Febu in Philadelphia exhorting us all to turn our backs on America's right to continue as a free and independent nation. This was followed up in January 1976 with a ceremonial signing of this declaration by 126 United States Senators and Congressmen, every one of whom thereby violated his oath to preserve and defend our present United States Constitution. And if you examine the list of 27 sponsors of the Senate Child Care Bill, you will find that no fewer than 19 of them also signed the treasonous Declaration of Interdependence. These are the same forces at work. Today we no longer have an elected President to stand in the way of the child controllers in Congress, only alert, angry citizens who so far have stymied the Bill's progress through sheer intimidation of both Houses of Congress. Those who are focusing specifically on this Bill have accurately identified its key dangers. To begin with, the whole Bill is built around the concept of a, quote, partnership, unquote, between the parent and government in rearing and training the child. But partners, my friends, are co-owners of any enterprise for which the partnership is formed. Thus if you allow the Federal Government to become your partner under this bill, you will be given away a part interest in your own child. The ramifications of this partnership concept ricochet all through the Child Control Bill and can hardly be missed. But the real joker in this deck consists of just 14 brief words buried clear back on page 56 of the Senate version and page 64 of the House version. Title 5, Section 501, Part 8, 
gives the following important definition for the purposes of the bill, and I quote, Parent means any person who has primary day-to-day -day responsibility for any child." Unquote. With this one key definition, which does not limit itself to normal usage, the writers of the Child Control Bill have thrown the door wide open for ever-expanding government control over your child through endless interpretation, reinterpretation, expansion, and elaboration under bureaucratic regulation. It is open-ended. It is an open invitation for the Federal Government to maneuver into position to declare itself the parent of your child, leaving you with no parental rights or powers at all. When and if that is allowed to happen, the family as we know it will have been destroyed, and the Rockefeller Soviet World Empire will reign supreme for a brief moment over a broken and ruined society before it crumbles and collapses into a repetition of the Dark Ages. Right now, as I said, this bill to pave the way for dictatorial child control is temporarily stalled by citizen alertness and protest, but if you think that is the end of the matter, listen. The planned strategy of the child controllers is to lull the bill's citizen's opponents to sleep, if possible, by soft peddling it. Their plan is to put it in the closet and keep it there until the very end of the current session of Congress if need be, and then when the citizen protesters have evaporated in the belief that they have won, the Child Control Bill will suddenly be whisked out of the closet and passed before we know what hit us. If this happens, the Rockefeller Brothers will be very close to final success in achieving the objective spelled out over 70 years ago for the Rockefeller program to take over education under the guise of philanthropy. When John D. Rockefeller, Sr. set up the powerful General Education Board in 1904, its purpose was spelled out clearly in its very first publication called Occasional Letter No. 1. It says, and I quote, in our dreams we have limitless resources, and the people yield themselves with perfect docility to our molding hands. The present educational conventions fade from our minds, and unhampered by tradition we work our own good will upon a grateful and responsive row of folk." Unquote. And the punchline, my friends, a few sentences later is, so we will organize our children into a community and teach them to do in a perfect way the things their fathers and mothers are doing in an imperfect way in the homes, in the shop, and on the farm." Unquote. Topic No. 2. I have often commented that to get a glimpse of where the United States economy is heading, one need only look at Great Britain. She is careening along down the road to disaster, and we are not far behind. Early this month the British pound sterling crashed downward through the $2 level of parity for the first time in history, and it is still unstable. Meanwhile, the United States dollar also is in trouble in international currency markets which are becoming more jittery and unstable by the day. A full-blown international currency crisis is now erupting, exactly as planned by the Rockefeller Brothers when they forced Europe to agree to a floating dollar with no fixed value on March 16, 1973. At a stroke, the Brenton Woods system of fixed exchange rates established in 1944 was wiped out, and now we are back to the monetary anarchy and nationalism of the 1930s, pushed there 
by the Rockefellers. This invites trade wars, speculation, and rampant devaluations and all of these dangerous developments are beginning to materialize. The shocking 20% devaluation of the Italian Lira a few days ago is only a harbinger of things to come, and the key target in all of this is still our own United States dollar. Soon the crescendo of events in Southern Africa will throw more gasoline onto the fires of the world monetary instability as the big prize, the Union of South Africa, faces a life and death struggle after Rhodesia is disposed of by the Rockefeller Soviet Cuban mercenaries fighting in that area. Even now, though you are hearing nothing about this through the kept Rockefeller news media, Panicky citizens of Rhodesia and South Africa are trying to find some way to pull up their financial stakes and leave, but they are trapped because of currency controls in those countries. Soon, according to Rockefeller plans which I revealed as long ago as February 1974, the gold mines of South Africa are to be hit by strife, sabotage, civil war, warfare, and as the gold supply from that source is substantially curtailed, gold prices will be forced upward while our floating dollar sinks. The Rockefeller Brothers are bent on controlling the vast mineral riches of South Africa, including especially the very large uranium deposits there and the secret uranium enrichment process South Africa has developed that is the most economical in the world. World Wars I and II were fought over oil. World War III again involves oil, but the emphasis this time is shifting to uranium since the Rockefellers are determined to make nuclear power the energy wave of the future under their monopolistic control. The International Monetary Crisis will have its consequences here at home in rekindled inflation, credit crunch, and all the other economic ills that it spawns. The manipulated Dow Jones Industrial Average hit 1,000 a few days ago on March, 12, March 11, 1976, at a time when true unemployment, according to my own sources within the Department of Labor, has now reached 19.1% nationwide. Meanwhile, the specter of threatened defaults, Lockheed in May, New York in June, and others is again coming into view. You also have been hearing about all kinds of banking problems through the courtesy of the Rockefeller propaganda machine which wants you to be aware of them in order to help undermine your confidence. But there are some aspects to the banking picture right now that are far more major than anything you are being told about through the Rockefeller media which involve real mistakes and difficulties faced by the Rockefellers themselves. I'm not referring here to those nerve-jangling front-page stories about Chase Manhattan and First National City Bank which were planted by the Rockefellers themselves for reasons I have explained in another monthly AUDIO LETTER recently. I refer instead to the situation which recently sent Henry Kissinger packing off to Latin America. If you did not quite understand what our Secretary of State was doing there, don't feel bad. You weren't supposed to. Kissinger was sent there as a bill collector for David Rockefeller, who has suddenly discovered that his banking interests, including the United States Export-Import Bank, have about $25 billion in outstanding credits in Latin America that are very shaky indeed. The four brothers have been so busy prying into everyone else's business that they have not been minding their own store. As presently scheduled, Kissinger's trip is to be followed up in May by a trip by Secretary of Treasury William Simon before he resigns to continue working for David Rockefeller in some other slot, perhaps at Chase Manhattan Bank. 
Simon can hardly wait to get out of the Treasury hot seat he has been ever since December 1975 when we caught him in an outright lie, in writing no less, about the existence of the Central Core Vault of the Bullion Depository at Fort Knox. The Rockefeller Banking picture is in additional hot water because for various reasons Arab OPEC interests began pulling out their funds in this country starting early this month. March 1976. Around $20 billion in Arab money may be withdrawn, but because of our dishonest fractional reserve banking system, which normally works to the advantage of the Rockefellers, the Arab withdrawals could translate into a drop of over $100 billion in total bank deposits. That is enough to trigger some serious economic repercussions prematurely before the Rockefellers are ready to mesh them into their complex program, and that is why the Federal Reserve Board surprised a lot of people last week by starting to pump funds into the banking system. And so it goes. As the four Rockefeller brothers continue to husband their own cash resources to take advantage of cheap bargains while walking the tightrope to dictatorship, meanwhile what is Congress doing for us? Last month there was a brief ray of hope when Congressman Wright Patman uncovered a hornet's nest by exposing a network of interlocks between the Federal Reserve System and the powerful Business Roundtable which helped defeat Patman's latest attempt to audit the Federal Reserve. This could have spelled real trouble for the Rockefeller Brothers because both the Business Roundtable and the Federal Reserve are 24 karat Rockefeller, but fortunately for the Rockefellers Patman just happened to become seriously ill before he could carry the matter any further, and he passed away early this month, and with him died any hope that the matter will be pursued an inch further. Now we are left with the likes of Congressman Otis Pike, who made the terrible mistake of pulling his punches at the Rockefeller CIA. Had he followed through on the Fort Knox matter after our discussions with him last September, he would be in the driver's seat now. But as it is, the CIA has now vowed to finish Otis Pike politically, and you can be sure they will try. And then there's Congressman John Conlon, who several months ago hurled a challenge at his constituents who dared to press him for action about Fort Knox, saying that if they had evidence of any wrongdoing, he would put them in contact with the appropriate authorities to carry out an investigation. But when my colleague Ed Durrell, who, with myself, does have access to such evidence, took up the Conlon Challenge forwarded to us by those constituents, Congressman Conlon apparently forgot all about his pledge to help establish the proper contacts to get a true investigation rolling. In my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 8 for January 1976, I read Ed Durrell's open letter to Congressman Conlon of January 7, 1976, in its entirety. Here now is Congressman Conlon's reply in its entirety, dated February 26, 1976, seven weeks after the date of Mr. Ed Durrell's certified letter, and I quote, Dear Mr. Durrell, Following up receipt of your certified open letter to me, I wanted to bring you up to date on my actions. I have written to the Chairman of the House Banking, Currency, and Housing Committee, Henry Royce, Chairman of the House Domestic Monetary Policy Committee, Wright Patman, and Chairman of the House Government Operations Committee, Jack Brooks. I will let you know when I receive their replies. Also, I am enclosing a copy of my letter to Secretary Simon in which I request a complete inventory of United States gold holdings. I have asked him to let me know what action he plans to take in this regard. It is unfortunate that there are not more Congressmen and people in the Administration and the Attorney General's Office who are more interested in clarifying this matter. I am just one sincere Congressman, Mr. Durrell, and much as you and I would like to think I cannot order official Washington to do yours in my bidding. If I could, Henry Kissinger and others would have been replaced a long time ago. Cordially, John B. Conlon, 
member of Congress, and that, my friends, is apparently that, as far as John Conlon is concerned, he continually professes to be concerned about Fort Knox, yet here is not even the token of an attempt to open any doors for a good investigation into the matter. No speeches on the House floor, no press conference, no real follow-up to Mr. Durrell's letter in any way. Just a very intimate letter to William Simon, Treasury Secretary, who himself is party to the cover-up. Why doesn't John Conlon tell us what Bill Simon told him on the night of January 5, 1975, in private? Conlon did not even bother to dignify his reply to Mr. Durrell with a personal signature as he did to Simon. Instead, a signature duplicating machine was used. Yes, this is the same Congressman, John B. Conlon, you may have read about recently leading the White House prayer breakfast. This is the same Congressman, John B. Conlon, whose name you will see as the author of a religious tract exhorting citizens to get involved. And this is the same Congressman John B. Conlon who, as the member of the House Banking Committee, has accepted money for his re-election campaign from the banking lobby. Apparently this is Congressman Conlon's concept of what it means to be a representative, and in one respect at least he is completely representative. He may not represent you or me but he does accurately represent what the United States Congress stands for today. His behavior is a perfect example of why our Republic is so close to extinction today. This being the case, I for myself shall now leave him alone with his own conscience. Topic No. 3 Recently. A CBS reporter asked Nelson Rockefeller if he would still like to be President. He shot back, What do you think I've been doing for the past 16 years? He has actually been at it longer than that, my friends, and now the prize he has kept his eyes focused on for so long is almost within his grasp. But because of the foreshortened time schedule now remaining to him, we are now entering a period of tactical maneuvering that is likely to be bewildering in its dodges and reversals of apparent direction. This final phase has already begun, in fact, since I spoke to you just last month, and already one major tactical shift has occurred. When I recorded Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 9 last month, my information was that the plan was to make President Ford stumble in the primaries and force him to bow out before the onslaught of Ronald Reagan. The goal of forcing Ford out soon has not changed one iota, but the tactics to achieve this have been revised drastically for reasons directly related to former President Nixon's trip to China late last month. In other words, to understand our domestic politics now, you also must look at the international scene. Last November 1975, you will recall that Ford went to China. While he was there, the Chinese leaders confronted him about the huge Asian war that is now brewing, and I am told that Ford turned pale and wobbly as he learned about these things for the first time from the Red Chinese. What they told him about the grand strategy for the war was the same thing I told you that same month in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 6 about the Middle East being the opening gun, about the role of the Helsinki Accord last summer, about the strategy of the encirclement of Red China by means of the Rockefeller Soviet conquest of Southeast Asia. Even now as I say these words, the domino theory is being dusted off and revived to explain the plan toppling soon of the last important domino in that area, Thailand. The 5,000 or so Americans there include a fifth-column contingent that is to pave the way for Thailand to be handed over to the Communists under Soviet control. 
When Ford returned, he began working as closely as possible with Richard Nixon, and now the team of Nixon, Ford, and Conley are engaged in a power struggle against Nelson Rockefeller and his lackeys, Ronald Reagan and Hubert Humphrey. As I have revealed in previous AUDIO LETTERS, Richard Nixon is on the phone just about daily to tell Ford to hang in there, and so far Ford has done so. Nixon's trip to China last month was not at the request of the State Department, but instead at the request of President Ford himself. Nixon's trip to China was an errand of peace in that he is trying to maintain a link between the United States and China to offset as much as possible the hard alliance between the Rockefeller Brothers and the Soviets. Nixon knows very well that Nelson Rockefeller is still out to get him if possible. That is why Nixon was unwilling to make the trip on anything but a red Chinese airplane sent here for that purpose. Faced with this Nixon Ford Conley axes, Nelson Rockefeller decided several weeks ago on tactics designed to give his opponents a political judo throw, that is, to send them sprawling by using their own strength and momentum. First he reprogrammed his kept media to help instead of hurt Ford in the primaries, thus lulling Ford into false confidence over his own seemingly growing strength. Reagan is to be beaten for now, but not so badly that he would look bad later on when Rockefeller is ready to tap him as his Vice President. To make sure Reagan gets the message not to drop out of the campaign, Rockefeller told Reagan to remain a candidate against Ford, quote, as long as the money holds out, unquote. And just to make sure, Rockefeller's comments in this vein were echoed by his lackey Barry Goldwater, who ironically ran for President 12 years ago on the slogan, A Choice, Not an Echo. To further build up the self-confidence of the Nixon Ford Conley axes, and also to fool the Red Chinese if possible into thinking that a favorable shift in American policy is being achieved, other things are also being done. For example, Ford has now officially deleted the word detente from his vocabulary, and some harsher than usual words have been permitted to emanate from Washington in the direction of the Soviet Union. After all, words are cheap for domestic consumption. Meanwhile, the final touches are being put on the preparations for war, and at the same time several options are being prepared to enable Ford to be suddenly and surprisingly cut down and swept out of office. One option would involve the exposure of a fast-breaking financial scandal whose possible speed can be guessed at by the devastating experience undergone by Vice President Spiro Agnew in 1973. Other options, however, are also being prepared because Nelson Rockefeller intends to take no chances at this late date. When war, shortages, and economic catastrophe arrive, Nelson Rockefeller fully intends to be the beneficiary of it all, easing himself into power as our President and then Dictator. The eagerness with which he awaits this turn of events stands in stark contrast to the horrified reaction of other world figures who have learned recently about the imminent war. For example, early last December when I was in Europe and England, I gave a copy of my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 6 detailing the war plans to a person who played it for Prime Minister Harold Wilson. The result? On December 15 he secretly gave the Queen three months' notice of the fact that he intended to resign, and three days ago he stunned England and the world by doing just that. It is sad indeed that Richard Nixon, who is now doing what he can to fight for peace, was nonetheless used successfully by the Rockefellers to do our nation grave injury in many areas while he was President, just as they have done with every President since Woodrow Wilson. And it is ironic that Nelson Rockefeller's plan to declare an iron-fisted national emergency soon will make use of a tool left to him by none other than his present bitter enemy, Richard Nixon. I refer to Presidential Executive Order 11490 dealing with emergency preparedness 
signed by Nixon October 28, 1969. It is 33 pages long. It spells out vast powers and functions to be exercised by 28 Federal Departments and agencies in the event of a declared national emergency. Under the terms of this Executive Order, these emergency powers can be activated either by Congress or by proclamation of the President. To the unwary, the idea may come across that this Executive Order would only be used in time of war due to the frequent reference to, quote, emergency, including an attack on the United States, unquote. But note well that war is actually just given as an example of an emergency situation. At the outset it is stated to be applicable, quote, in any national emergency type situation that might conceivably confront the nation." Unquote. No other criteria are given to govern the declaration of such an emergency. Therefore, all that Nelson Rockefeller or another President or Congress needs to do is to conceive of a situation as fitting their concept of an emergency, and Executive Order 11490 can be invoked. It is to be done in the, quote, national interest, unquote, but that is never defined. But one section makes the purpose of the order explicitly clear in the words, and I quote, assuring the continuity of the Federal Government in any national emergency type situation that might confront the nation, unquote. The Federal Government is the focus here, not the nation not the people, not the Republic, but the Federal Government. In other words, it is designed for the benefit of our rulers, just as in the secret new Rockefeller Constitution. Once invoked, Executive Order 11490 authorizes unconstitutional and so illegal powers to be wielded by the Federal Government. Under the guise of bland sounding words, like Emergency Management and Operation, the Federal Government is authorized to completely take over business and industry or any parts thereof without compensation. Border closing and control, censorship, and the registration and continual monitoring of all citizens and their movements are also provided for under Executive Order 11490 with a quasi-private United States Postal Service playing an important role in this as I revealed in my AUDIO LETTER last month. Full powers over transportation and communication are also granted, along with all forms of energy right down to flashlight batteries. Even your pocket radio would be included because of the authority given to control any device capable of emitting electromagnetic radiation which your radio and TV do in small amounts. The clandestine Federal Police structure now in place in the United States, which I warned you about last month, would also be activated under this Executive Order. So would special emergency measures for custody and protection of prisoners. These are worded in such a way as to make their true meaning anything but obvious unless the phrase, quote, mass feeding and housing, unquote, is noticed. This refers, my friends, to the hush-hush concentration camps which are now in a condition of operational readiness in remote areas all around the United States. Executive Order 11490 even places at the disposal of the Federal Government that most cruel and most powerful of all tools for mass political control, hunger various provisions for stockpiling of survival items, food and water included, are worded in such a way that they could be initiated after the declaration of emergency rather than being prepared ahead of time to meet that emergency. Thus the Federal Government could artificially create terrible shortages at will under the guise of stockpiling. And if you think such a thing is too far-fetched, just remember back to the early days of World War II if you are old enough. Do you recall, for example, that you were required after war broke out to turn in any extra tires you may have had 
and thereafter had a hard time getting any new ones? The excuse given was the rubber had to be stockpiled and recycled into the war effort, but that was an outright lie. I have been given eyewitness accounts by people who saw these tires piled up, slashed, and burned after they were turned in, and the Congressional record in 1942 contains a great deal of material brought out by then Senator Harry Truman showing that there was a deliberate larger plan to deny many critical war materials both to the American public and our military forces in the early days of the war. And guess who was implicated in all of this? You're right, the Rockefeller Standard Oil interests. Given all of this, the possibility must not be overlooked that there will be no election next November if Nelson Rockefeller and his brothers successfully orchestrate the various elements of their do-or-die plan of conquest. Executive Order 11490, in the hands of a man who has shown himself to be unhampered by scruples or conscience, could be used in effect to suspend our present United States Constitution, and next November we may be given no choice at the polls except a yes or no vote in a national referendum on the proposed new Rockefeller Constitution. Voting on fixable voting machines under the watchful eyes of the Federal Police, the outcome, if that is permitted to happen, would be in very little doubt. Just as Cuba did last month on February 15, 1976, we could be counted upon to ratify a new Constitution to replace our suspended older one. These things do not have to happen, my friends. The Rockefeller Brothers can be made to trip by the spreading awareness of and reaction to the truth, the absolute truth. But in case there are any doubting Thomases listening to my voice, I say to you now, if you sit back and watch as all this comes to pass before your very eyes, do not look back a year from now and say, why weren't we warned? Because, my dear friend, you were. Until next month, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.